I also would like to welcome those who are joining us online on the www.asteroidday.org or asteroidfoundation.org. You're all more very welcome in joining us here. Uh, our program today is, let me thank, initially before I forget, our uh, funders for this program, the uh, European Union Erasmus Program, uh, the Fonds National, uh, National de Recherche. I'd like to thank him very much. And we must not forget that the uh, Asteroid Foundation is powered by the Luxembourg Space Agency. We're very grateful to them for continuously supporting us. Uh, we have today uh, a stellar panel of people for you uh, celebrating Asteroid Day, which is what we're here for. There are so many people around the world who have already celebrated or are celebrating the Asteroid Foundation, the Asteroid Day now. The format for today is we have five speakers who will talk about different aspects of their work, their research, their ideas from working into space. And then we'll have questions for each one of these from our distinguished guests here. And we really are in the presence of some excellent and distinguished people from a unique club, a niche club of people. There's only few of them who have been to space, and we're privileged to have very, very exciting group of people here who have all been in space. We have with us today, on my left here, is Dorin Pronariu, who uh, works uh, as an expert with the Romanian uh, Association for Space Technology. He has accomplished eight day space flights on board Soyuz 40 and Salyut 6 space stations. He's uh, the first Romanian cosmonaut. He is also the founding member of, and the president of the Association of Space Explorers. He was also the president of the Roma Romanian Space Agency. He was an ambassador of Romania, and he was a chair of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. He was a representative of Romania in the International Relations Committee of European Space Agency. And the list is very long. I'm sure if I continue to read it, we will, uh, <laughs> sorry, Dorin, we'll need another 30 minutes for that. But he has, authored many books. He has a PhD in uh, field of space field dynamics. And above all, he's a really nice gentleman. So please welcome Dorian Pranayu. And for the second day time today, because I've already introduced him once today at one of the schools in Luxembourg, I'd like to welcome Major Paolo Nespoli who was born in uh, Verano Brianza, in, uh, near Milano in Italy. And after he finished his uh, scientific school, he was drafted into the Italian army and worked as a military, in the military paratrooper school in Italy. And then with the army special forces, and then he had the rank of a warrant officer. But what's also interesting that from 1982 to 1984, he participated in the Italian contingency, contingent of the multinational peacekeeping force in Beirut during the civil war there. After that, he resigned from the army, and he went on to study for a bachelor uh, of science in aerospace in New York, followed a bus by a master of science in aeronautics and uh, uh, astronautics. He only retired in 2019. After completing 313 days, 2 hours, and 36 minutes of time in space. So we are really very privileged to have somebody like Paolo here. And please join in with me. And finally, and again, I've already introduced him yesterday to a school in Luxembourg. It's a great pleasure to welcome Christa Fuglsang, Dr. Christa Fuglsang. He uh, is the first... Uh, Swedish astronaut to go into space and during his Celsius mission he conducted three spacewalks things we dream about things you see in movies people going out out of the uh, space stations and wandering around he did that for him it became normal walking he did three spacewalks 
and he attached hardware station when they were uh, trying to configure the station's electrical power system. And he had an unscheduled third spacewalk when the uh, solar, pa solar array was jammed and was stuck. So he was also a walking mechanic trying to free up the, uh, the stuck ends in the, in the uh, installations up there. But, I mean, I'm a chemist myself, and I know one of the things I hated working with was ammonia. And he did a spacewalk to install an ammonia tank on the space station. The ammonia is used for cooling the electrical circuits. So he did some really impressive, and it's quite dangerous walk up there, carrying some unpleasant materials there. He is currently professor of aeronautics at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and he's a director of the uh, KTH Space Center, and he teaches a course on human space flight, and he still does his own research. He's a particle physicist, so we're actually very honored to have Krista here amongst us today, and I'd like you to join me in welcoming him as well. Krista. So the format of this uh, afternoon now is that we have the speakers, they will ask, they will come up here one at a time, and they are distinguished, and you'll be surprised by what we have also for you today. It really is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a package of immense surprises here. Uh, they will come and give a short presentation, and then each of our distinguished guests here will ask one question, and then we can open it to the uh, public. I mean, I'm in charge of the time, so we'll open it to the public. And after we finish all of this, uh, you're all welcome to join us to the uh, cocktail hour afterwards, which is sponsored by One World, which has a desk over there. We're very grateful to them for doing this. And thank you very much, One World. Who's in here from One World? Not that, no one yet? Anyway, thank you very much. It's recorded online. So the first speaker of the day is uh, Marco Micheli. Marco, please come onto the stage. He's an astronomer and uh, observer of near-Earth asteroids at ESA's Near-Earth Objects Coordination Center. He's an Italian astronomer, professional observer of near-Earth asteroids. Um, he calls himself an asteroid hunter as well, I think. <laughs> so, and uh, he was very interested in space from a very young age an amateur astronomer, and he did work at the local observatory in Breccia in, uh, in his hometown. Then he got a degree from Pisa. And then uh, he earned his PhD in Hawaii at Maanoa. And during his years at Maanoa, he had a chance to use the exceptional telescopes at Mauna Kea and Halea Ka'ala. Kala. He observed asteroids, he observed comets, and studied their dynamics in the solar system. Uh, his main focus is the extraction of high precision astrometry, which is accurate positional measurements of where an asteroid appears from optical images. And since the discovery of o Oumuamua, the, that's the first interstellar object discovered while transitioning in our solar system in 2017, he's also been deeply interested in the observational and dynamical studies of interstellar objects. And I think I've said enough about you, and I'd like to hand over the stage to you. Thank you. If you'd like, uh, yeah. and I will, and I will. Okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, and thanks for inviting me here. I'm going to give you a short uh, talk, short description of what is currently done for what we call planetary defense, which is basically the whole scientific and technical field behind the observations and computations and uh, all the rest of the work to protect our planet from the impact of, of asteroids. I work for the European Space Agency at uh, what we call the NEO Coordination Center in, near Rome, in Frascati. And uh, so let's just start. I'm going to start with two videos here, just to show you that impacts of asteroids, I mean, you probably know because you've chosen to be here today, but they are not 
just science fiction, it's something that really does happen. And uh, this video is a pretty famous one, there's many actually of the same event, happened in Russia 10 years ago, it's the Chelyabinsk asteroid, it's like a 20 meter asteroid that fell over the city in Russia. And uh, this is being seen quite a lot by people there, of course it's a populated place. But that's not the only big asteroid that fell recently on our planet. Uh, this happened five years ago on the, basically, uh, offshore Kamchatka in Russia again. And it's only seen by satellites because nobody lives there. But in a decade, basically, we've had two 10, 20 meter asteroid falling on our planet, at least two we know of. One of which actually caused about 2,000 injuries on the ground. Fortunately, fortunately, nobody died, but it was a major event. So these things do happen all the time. And uh, this is just a, I don't know if it can be read, maybe the projector is not uh, sharp enough for you to read. I'm just gonna summarize. It's a, it's a plot of the frequency, how often an asteroid of a certain size falls on the Earth and how much damage it does. But especially this last section is what I want to show you. This column here is for kilometer and larger asteroids. And these are the ones that can do global damage on planetary scales. And here we have good news. We have good news because about, we think there are about a thousand out there in the solar system that can come close to the Earth. And we found about, let's say, 95% of them. So the large ones, the, the ones that may make us end like dinosaurs, we've, we're keeping track on them. The situation gets much worse if you go on smaller sizes. And especially if you go to like 100 meters, we've only found one in four of the ones we think exist. If we go down to 10 meters, and I remember 10 meters is the video that I've shown you, so it, like it's something that can take out a city or a small country like Luxembourg, we know 1% of them. So we are very far from being complete in our knowledge of these objects. So what are we doing? Because of that, because we're still far from being complete, space agencies and universities and observatories have programs dedicated to studying these things. And uh, this is just an example of how we set it up in Europe at, at ESA. It's basically three different topics, uh, what we will detect, assess, and mitigate. And I'm gonna go through them and give you an example of what is done in each of these three, we call them pillars, to uh, protect us, European citizens, and the world in general from the threat of asteroids. Let's start with this, detect. This is the one that's closest to me because I'm an observer, I'm an astronomer. So I like telescopes. <laughs> and uh, well, this is the one, one that is, seems to be going well. <laughs> uh, this is the rate of discovery of asteroids, of near-Earth asteroids, meaning the ones that can come close to the Earth, starting from the first one that was found in 1890 to today, 2023. And uh, what we see is that the rate of discovery, this is per decade, so in 1980s, we were finding 80 per decade of these things. Nowadays, we're finding 3,000 per year. So we're doing much, much better at finding these things. You've seen the numbers before. We still haven't found them all. We're still far, far, far away from that goal. But at least we are getting much better at spotting them. How do we spot them? We spot them with these things that we call survey telescopes. They are dedicated telescopes on Earth, ground-based telescopes, that basically scan the, the sky every night looking for something that moves. An asteroid will look like a little dot, a little star, but contrary to stars, it moves in the sky. So it just mostly automatically look for these things that move in the sky. And uh, of course, they do it from Earth and they do it at night, which seems trivial, but it's not actually because that is a problem. They do it from Earth, they're small-ish telescopes, so they cannot see very, very far away. They cannot see the faintest, farthest away asteroids. And uh, they cannot yet cover the whole sky every single night. And they operate at night, so they cannot look in the direction of the sun. So the future for this, the future expansion of the story will be that we will be larger telescope, telescope that can cover the whole sky every night or so, and ideally go to space so that we will have the right technology we need to spot every asteroid that comes our way. Of course, it's a process that will happen in the next decade, two decades or something in order to reach the goal from the first slide to be as complete as possible in our discovery rates. And uh, discovering them is not the whole story though. These things move. The discovery telescopes just do discovery. They just spot them for the first time and they tell the world, look, I found something there, 
then they don't care about that thing anymore. What we need to do is to do follow-up, so to keep an eye on the most important ones. There's a little problem, though. The telescopes that find most of the asteroids nowadays, and this will change in the next decade, but nowadays, they are in the US, southwest of the US to Hawaii, basically, in that area of the world. Sometimes getting the observations after discovery, what we call the follow-up observation, requires very quick reaction times. You have to do it within hours or minutes sometimes of the discovery. There's a big thing here called the Pacific Ocean, though. The Earth rotates that way. So if we are European and something is discovered here in the US, well, it will get dark over Europe only 12 hours after. And that may not be enough. So for example, one thing we do a lot at the European Space Agency is to get access to telescopes all over the world, and we, that's the network we have, and be ready to do the follow-up observations of new discoveries, at least the high-priority ones, the ones we think may be dangerous, on very short notice. And this is something I really like of this field as a scientist, but also as a, as a human being. It's a very, very collaborative field. Everything we do, I mean, I, I told you, most of them are found in the US, but we in Europe do a lot of this follow-up work, and we use telescopes in many different countries. So it's really a cooperative work, a coordinated work among astronomers and researchers, literally all over the world, basically. And then, of course, you may need also the biggest telescopes on the planet. Sometimes you really have to use telescopes that are not the one out of your local observatory, the one next door. You really need to go to the best telescopes in the world. And planetary defense is now, fortunately, a popular enough uh, topic that we actually do get access to the best telescopes on the planet to do work on the highest priority of these objects, on the ones that are more threatening for us and more scary for our planet. This is just something I want to quickly mention. I'm an optical observer. I use telescopes on the Earth, but that's not the end of the story. Of course, there are other ways to observe asteroids. One very famous one was radar, doing radar detections of asteroids with radio telescopes. And this is one of the few parts of this whole story that unfortunately is going worse than before because we've lost, as you may know, the biggest radar, radio, radio telescope on the planet, Arecibo, two years ago. And that's a big, big uh, loss for the community because radar is a unique technique to observe an asteroid in space. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'm, a, as was said in the presentation, I'm an astrometrist, so I'm studying basically the dynamical part of the motion of asteroids. But that's not the end of the story, of course. There is a parallel part of the astronomical field that takes care of studying what we call the physical characterization of asteroids. So telling us what they're made of, how big they are, how solid uh, they are, and so on. And as you can guess, that's very, very important if ever one of them will come towards us because we want to know what's made of. That's what is going to tell us the, what's going to happen, basically, when it hits us. So the second part, this assessment. This is basically using the data that astronomers like me produce to compute the trajectory of an asteroid and predict its motion. And it's actually a very interesting process because it's done mostly by mathematicians but it's in very close connection with astronomers like me because it's a sort of an iteration between observations. So let's imagine that we have observed an asteroid for three nights in the sky, we've seen it there. So now we can use this information to compute the trajectory of that asteroid and predict where that asteroid is tonight. So let's assume that we predict that our asteroid tonight is moved to that part of the sky. Well, it's a prediction, it's a scientific prediction. So it's not a point, it's actually an, a point plus an error bar, as basically everything in physical sciences. So what we have is that we have a, an area with where in the sky that asteroid can be. We don't know exactly where inside that area the asteroid really falls, because our trajectory is not known well enough to predict to great accuracy. So again, this is the mathematical side. Now we go back to the astronomers, to observers like me, that have telescopes, and they just point the telescope at that part of the sky, and look, the asteroid is within the uncertainty, but not exactly in the center of where we predicted, which is actually excellent, because now we can have a better orbit of the asteroid, which predicts better the motion of the asteroid in the future. And that's what we do, basically. It's all this alternance between observations and computations that allows us to really predict better and better the motion of an asteroid in the solar system. And the end result is this thing, basically. This is the European counterpart. NASA has the same thing in the US. It's what we call the risk list. 
and it's a list of all known asteroids that have a non-zero chance of hitting the Earth in the next century. Non-zero means that we doesn't mean that we know that they will hit. Fortunately, no, for none of them we are certain. But we cannot exclude the fact that they will hit the Earth. And uh, this thing is computed in real time in Europe and in the US in a completely streamlined way, ingesting all the new data that gets produced by astronomers with mathematicians doing the computations. And everything gets published in real time, basically on websites, so everyone can see these things, and they can choose, like astronomers like me, can choose the most important targets, the most important asteroids, because as you've seen in the beginning, we know tens of thousands of these things we have to prioritize, and this is where we prioritize, because we prioritize with planetary defense purposes in mind, so we prioritize with the idea of chasing, following up the ones that pose a potential threat to our planet. And, uh, well, good news, it works. <laughs> it's not all uh, on paper. It works because we have been able to predict impacts so far of seven very small asteroids so far. First one was in 2008, and it worked super well. It was found in the sky. That little dot you see there is the asteroid. It's predicted that it was going to hit the Earth actually 20 hours after discovery. It was then pinpointed the location to kilometer level accuracy by computations with all the data that was collected. It was really seen by satellites, so the, something exploded really in that area. It's in the north of Sudan, middle of the desert, of course, not, not very dangerous. And then pieces of the asteroid were actually found. So we know how to do this thing very well. It works. We can predict impacts if we discover the object in time. And that's why astronomers like me have a job, because we have to find them and keep an eye on them. Finally, mitigation. That's the third step, is what we can do to protect the Earth. And it's basically two things. The first one, we've seen it last fall in a real life example, is try to deflect these things. Some of you may have heard about the DART mission, the NASA mission that went to a binary asteroid, hit one of them, and pushed it away a bit. It's a fantastic technological uh, demonstration of the fact that we, n we now know for sure we can deflect an asteroid. And this is a pretty big thing, I mean, in the hundreds of meters size. So we have this technological capability right now. And uh, the second thing we can do is to be prepared in case we have an impact on Earth, predicted maybe on a shorter notice where we cannot do a mitigation, we cannot deflect it, and we have to do things on the, on, on the ground. And it's actually really good because now we are actually doing this. We are, as astronomers, as scientists, we are working together with civil protection, with governments, with institutions that take care of all the... Uh, civil protection on the ground, and we have exercises where we simulate a scenario of an actual impact story. And uh, with these people, part of the simulation, we actually show them what we as scientists can produce, what kind of information can provide, and they tell, you, they tell us what they need to be prepared in case of a prediction of something that will hit a populated area or an area with important infrastructures. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention and ready for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Marco, for sticking nearly to the time. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I'll pass on to uh, Dorin here for the first question. Um. So we, we encourage people to do science, to discover. No? Not working? Yes? OK. Uh, maybe you tell us um, what is the percentage of the discoveries made by private astronomers comparing with the professional institutions and uh, observatories? This is a very interesting question because it allows me to say something. The discoveries are, does it work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. good. <laughs> True. The discoveries are done, I would say, more than 95% by professionals, but the follow-up that I discussed, that is not the case. That is done, I would say, mostly by amateurs still. And as I presented, it's essential. It's the only way we have to prevent discoveries from being useless, because the object can be lost. So amateurs are still playing a fantastic role in this. It's amazing how much they can do with passion and with even smaller instruments. And this field is among the scientific fields, probably the one that uses, one of the ones that uses experience and the passion of us amateurs the most. And it's really uniquely 
suited for that kind of collaboration. Love it. <laughs> so it's, I really encourage people who are interested in astronomy as an amateur to go into the asteroid field to explore because we really need you a lot. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Marco? Paolo, sorry, Paolo? Which, whoever wants to go first. Krista. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, you, you uh, kind of talk about detect, assess, and mitigate, and clearly you need all of them, but is there any one of these three which you would consider today is the weakest link, and if you got some extra money, I mean, how would you use the, those money to kind of improve that? I would say, good point, uh, the f probably the discovery, because the numbers are still on the low side. I mean, something like 100 meters asteroid that can take out a country, basically, and we only know a quarter of them. So that really needs to, to, to change. It really needs to, really need to, to, to be better at that. Then the mitigation part, it's a bit delayed. It's something that has started a bit later compared to the other uh, sectors of this. But I think it's easier to catch up. You just need to, the right people in the right, in the right uh, situation, the right mindset, and it's going to be easier to catch up. The discovery needs hardware, needs technology, and that needs money, of course. So I would say discovery. Okay, thanks. Paul. Uh, yes, uh, I would say that, you know, after having been on the space station for quite some time, and, uh, you know, almost every evening going to the cupola and feeling kind of strange because you're sitting there and you actually see things zapping between you and the earth. And you think, these are, <laughs> these are asteroids? Probably. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the yes, definition. Yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> kind of really small little Pieces thing. That, yeah. But I had uh, a couple of cases of uh, big things Things, yeah. happening not far away from the space station and, and thinking, wow, if they think, in fact, there was one case where I pictured one which I thought was pretty big. I sent down the information to Ezrin, to the uh, center at ESA, and they told me, yeah, if they think would have hit the station, probably would have vaporized uh, yeah. the whole station <laughs> or at least a couple <laughs> of... Uh, of modules. of modules, so said that, yeah. which, you know, it doesn't gives you a good feeling of being on the station. On the other hand, the station has been up there for 20, 20 years, years more now. or less, yeah. and uh, it was never hit by big thing. There was never a depressurization due to an impact. penetration of, uh, of uh, an asteroid or some kind of debris, oh, debris or object debris. or anything like this. So that, this is kind of an answer that I give all the time when they tell me there's plenty of junk or plenty of, well, you know, people kind of yeah. make a big, big thing about junk and meteorites and debris and things like that. So my answer is that Doesn't happen it's that true often. that there are a lot of uh, asteroids or debris up there, but it's also true that the space is big. Space and is big, so yes. the chances that they actually hit you are relatively go small. <laughs> going to go back a bit. <laughs> that doesn't mean that they, they are not going to hit you. It means that there is a certain uncertainties about this thing and uh, and so I, I, I'm just trying to find a, a kind Sorry. of uh, uh, reassurance for the people that are on the space yeah. station that you know, they should still small, sleep yeah. <laughs> in kind of uh, relaxed I, I think uh, they should, situation. Yeah. I, think, I think the idea is that space station is small. I mean, comparable to a house, a building, I mean, something like well, that. Space I mean, station is yeah. big, but it's, okay, okay, small, it's small for compared to the planet. Outside. Exactly. It's small compared to the planet. And I mean, how many people do you know that got hit by an asteroid on their home? Probably none of them. So it's, it's a small number statistics when you look at an individual building or an individual city or an individual person. It's more like a planetary scale thing when you see that planetary scales that you do see some numbers for that. 
I mean, they're small numbers. Uh, as I said before, like a 10 meter object, something like Chelyabinsk, happens every 10 years or so. So it's highly unlikely in a certain sense that every one of us will experience an impact on an asteroid. Why do we do this? Well, we do it because, first of all, there's a lot of us <laughs> on Earth, more than uh, in space. And uh, so therefore, when you add up on 7 billion people, it becomes not so unlikely. And the second thing that I like to point out is that this is maybe not the most frequent natural catastrophe that can happen on this planet, but it's probably the only one we can predict. Everything else, I mean, volcanoes, earthquakes, they, they do more damage, of course, than these things. I mean, unless the big one comes, but for the small ones, they do more damage than Marco, this. Marco, you know what the biggest catastrophe would be? If people do not have a cocktail at 6 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so I will make it short. So that's the thing. It's predictable. So we can invest money and make sure that we do something in time. The others, we cannot. So if we can continue this after the... Sure. Uh, Thank you so approach much. Approach me and ask me any questions you have. But th thank you, thank you for the answer. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Thank you. Anybody who has questions, you can continue afterwards. But I think we need uh, to push on. So our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Slava Turichev. He's an astrophysicist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. Uh, he's uh, at, the, uh, at the California Institute of Technology and a professor of at physics and astronomy department in the University of California. Um, he earned his MSc in physics and PhD in quantum field theory from the uh, Lomonosov Moscow State University in Russia in 87 and 1990, respectively. In uh, 2008, he earned a DSC um, from the same university. His primary research areas include gravitational fundamental physics in space, research in uh, relativistics, astrophysics, astronomy, and planetary science. Uh, he has published a large number of papers, about 220 peer-reviewed papers, two books, and he's a member of the International Academy of Astronautics. And today, he will talk to us about how microsats can help find near-Earth asteroids. The platform is yours, sir. Excellent. I think I'm on. Am I? Do you hear me well? Excellent. Thank you, Paul. So this one works? Okay, much better. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Very interesting. I don't know that guy you, you mentioned. So, uh, but um, I'm here. I will be talking about something uh, very different. Uh, Marco introduced the topic. It was, was great in the discussion that Paolo brought in. How, speak to the microphone, please. Um, the discussion, actually, how, uh, what is there? So asteroids, uh, people who study astronomy, who, who do astronomy, they actually see the asteroids. And in reality, people who fly in space, um, as, uh, cosmonauts and astronauts, they see a lot of uh, events that are happening there. They are aware. Us who live on this planet, they don't, we don't really s uh, have the appreciation how many of them and what are they, uh, and, 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 what, what do, and what those objects are. I will make the case of taking this. I think this is fine. I just need to be much closer. Okay. I need to learn how to speak in the microphone. Thank you very much. This is better, right? So I guess the point is I would like to take, uh, to make the case about bringing this uh, new technology in space and searching for asteroids from small sats. Because on the ground-based astronomy, it's, it's amazing uh, that we can do from the ground. And new technologies, new instruments that will be deployed soon, they will be able to do a very good job. But the saturation effect, because those, uh, uh, the orbits of asteroids, the elliptical orbits, and essentially, we need to be able to track all of those asteroids that come irregularly. So they don't come every year, they come maybe every, every five or three years. So we need to be able to track all of those with instruments that we have not only on the ground, but those in space as well. So this is a wonderful planet. Look at this. So at, uh, 8 billion people live on this planet, and it took almost, what, 4.6 billion years to develop their life on this planet. It's wonderful. But as we know, uh, we have example from the history of dinosaurs actually extinct because of their neighbors. And so our neighbors in the solar system, look at those. So those neighbors are plenty. 
And you see the motion of asteroids in main belt. There are many of those asteroids. And they actually move in irregular orbits. Most of them are uh, circular orbits. But because of the interaction among the asteroids, those orbits are no longer elliptical. Uh, they're no longer circular. They, many of them have elliptical orbits. And some of them actually look at them. Uh, they move with its outer solar system, and then you go in the uh, in the uh, in the inner so so in the inner solar system. So essentially, if you come closer, this is Earth, and so many of them actually intersect the Earth orbit. So they do come close, and so they come uh, they intersect the orbit, and some of them may come dangerously close to our planet. And so that's what is important for us to track all the, all those asteroids. How well do we do that? So. Um, Look at those events in the past. So those, the size of the uh, circle indicates the uh, size of the asteroid. And essentially, you see how long ago, so meter class, kilometer, 10 kilometers, and essentially how many years ago, how many million years ago they actually impacted Earth. We have evidence. And if you look at the planetary surface, Mars, uh, uh, Mercury, uh, the Moon, you see a lot of craters. So not only Earth, in the solar system, these guys come every year, they, uh, they impact. For example, I will show some, some slides how Mars actually uh, impa uh, was impacted by asteroids. So the reality in our solar system dynamics. So um, moving forward, this is the examples of the crime scenes on our planet. And different uh, asteroids impacted Earth in different regions, different uh, periods of uh, Earth history. You see uh, they're very close to Los Angeles in Arizona, uh, 40,000 years ago, Arizona crater. And you see many of those objects. And you, you go on Wikipedia, you discover many, many, many objects. And with new technology that we have, uh, we can see those asteroidal impacts on Earth that actually now uh, uh, covered by lo lots of layers of er erosion and under ice, so we can see a lot of asteroids on the planet, so they're reality. Now talking about uh, the current events, you see they are pretty much keep coming. So they keep coming. This event, of course, we, we uh, Marco showed us the Chelabinsk uh, 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 meteorite that actually February 15th of 2015. And then another one you see here, it was uh, the asteroid was detected by a Japanese spacecraft going about Japan, and essentially from the space station, as, uh, as, 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 as uh, uh, we, we just heard, that actually on the space station you can see those impacts as they move in. And so there was a detection of uh, Hawaii, uh, the weather satellite in Japan actually, actually uh, detected as uh, the asteroid was going through. Now let's uh, talk about how many of them do we know? What do we expect in the solar system? How many of those asteroids do we know? Looking here, so this is near asteroid discovered, and you see the, we keep discovering them. It, it's good, but how well do we do that? Among all, all, the, all of those asteroids, near Earth asteroids, we know pretty much 32,000 of asteroids, but there are millions of them. Millions of them smaller class. They're, uh, what is uh, potentially hazardous asteroids, those that actually can intersect Earth orbit and actually they can make a big impact on, on the planet. So we know roughly, you know, uh, 2,300 of those, of those asteroids and 140 meters, so uh, mo more than a kilometer, if this asteroid comes on the planet, will be dangerous. So we need to know those for sure, and I think we know mo most of them. But we, uh, we have knowledge about 151 of, of those asteroids. There are some of them uh, actually still undiscovered. We, the problem with them, because asteroids do not shine light. They just reflect light. So you need to be able to see those asteroids because they are far away. And you need to have the technology that actually allows you to track, to detect, to get the light, and actually to detect them on a, on, on a bright background or on a dim background. Still very difficult to do that. So now, how, we do, how well do we do that? So this is the histogram. It's uh, from 0 to 30 uh, meters all the way to more than 1,000 kilometers. Uh, though, uh, in terms of how many do we know? Pretty much nearly complete above uh, kilometer size. Then go in, as, Mar as, as Marco mentioned, the smaller the size, the more difficult to detect those asteroids. Again, they don't shine light, they just reflect light. It's hard with the technology that we have, even with the large instruments, LSST or Vera Rubin instrument that will be soon operational, still very hard to detect them. So uh, now uh, it's uh, only like 15% completeness 
uh, for the asteroid between 30 and 100 meters. And the 100 meter asteroid, it's pretty bad for regional, uh, for, for, for if, if it impacts a country in Europe, it's bad. So if it goes anywhere in the world, it's bad as well. So it's even if, if, even if it impacts the ocean, you will see some, some maybe tsunami event if it's close, close, uh, close to the continent. So we need to know when they're coming. And then maybe, you know, Bruce Willis will be helpful, but it's, 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 not, it's not about uh, going with uh, Hollywood style uh, detection. It's really, uh, we need to have technology that actually will be able to divert the danger. But let's talk about what can be done in the near future. So we have a lot of instruments that are operational. Historically, you see this sort of chart of different instruments and most, uh, most productive, of course, uh, pan stars, uh, the Catalina Sky Survey, uh, uh, pan stars on Hawaii. Those instruments are very capable and they are very good in discovering new asteroids because they designed to do that. And essentially, you see in terms of the colors, Catalina green and uh, sort of the, this one is uh, um, uh, so it's a pan stars telescope on Hawaii. They do a very good job. But then uh, we expect more instruments uh, to come in into the picture. So these are the basically uh, their, their parameters. Uh, those parameters are very impressive, but still the challenge I will mention is that uh, those instruments still look at the same patch on the sky. You don't look back in the sun because you need to look away from the sun. With, with optical instruments, you're looking away from the sun. So immediately, you're looking uh, on a very small patch of the, of, the, of the sky. So some of the asteroids that are close to the sun, you just don't see because you don't look at the sun, right? And so essentially, those orbits are very inaccessible for us. We have developed new technology that's called synthetic tracking. It, basically, in the, in the past, we call it a shift and add, but now with the sensor that we have, multi-pixel sensor with, with, low, with very low read noise, we essentially are able to record a short uh, film, a uh, short frame about 300 seconds, and then we work with that frame, and we can actually stop all the stellar motion, and it's a digital processing. Now we can do shift and add each frame on the, in, the, in that uh, small, uh, small, small video recording. Essentially, we can process shift and add so that we can build the signal noise ratio. And so in terms of uh, when asteroids, again, uh, when they reflect light, and so they, because of the motion of the, those asteroids, photons that we detect on the, on the sensor, they're smeared on the sensor. So they're not, if asteroids are stationary, you get all the photons in one pixel. So this is the sensor. But if asteroid is moving, and they do move, right? So you get all those photons uh, in, the, in multiple pixels. And that leads to reduction signal noise ratio. So your sensitivity to detect decreases significantly. We are now, we now, we are now able to actually digi digitally post-process this information and then assign appropriate for photons to appropriate pixels. And so the, this is, it's a heavily computational in intent uh, per procedure, but now we mastered that. And so now we can actually, we actually were able to deploy this technology on the ground. And so those instruments, uh, simple, simple sensors, which are available from Sony, for example, you can buy so those sensors, the commercial available. Now with this technology, we are able to deploy on the small, small telescopes. So telescopes, uh, so this is, the, uh, this is the new discovery rate. So we are discovering those telescopes with 20 centimeter telescopes on the ground. You, you build farm of the telescope, you actually can be affordable, not, for the, not even for the National Science Foundation, uh, amateur telescopes. So we actually, actually built for, uh, like eight telescopes, 20 centimeter telescopes can actually do very impressive work to discover those asteroids. And so this is the new, new, new asteroids were discovered uh, a few years ago. Now the discovery rate is pretty impressive with this simple technology. Moving on, uh, this is uh, compared to LSST. LSST is amazing technology, but still, what, what we can do with this, uh, the challenge is the orbit. So the, those orbits that are those, um, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get to the point. Okay, so uh, with, the, with the telescope, small size telescope, you can deploy them in a small sat, in a small spacecraft, and put in five spacecraft in heliocentric orbit, you can drastically improve discovery rate and actually match and sur surpass the technology that is built be deployed in as LSST. Because saturation effect, the uh, large facility will be still looking at the same patch of the sky, but now you have five, uh, five microsats in a heliocentric orbit that will allow you to, to increase drastically discovery rate in uh, finding small, small asteroids on the 30 meter class, even 30 meter class. We are talking about not 100 meters, but going down. Remember, Chelyabinsk um, uh, event was only 60 meters before this object reached the atmosphere. We're talking about drastically increasing discovery rate of those instruments with the CubeSat missions. 
and that mission affordable for, for affordability of that mission spacecraft are available telescopes are available pretty much we're talking about not hundreds of millions of dollars it can be done under uh, under 70 million and actually discovery rate will be drastically improved so with this saving our planet is a key and discovering many many asteroids i think will be a way to to do that thank you very much thank you so much thank you Dorin? Slava, maybe you are the most uh, specialized person to, to, to answer next question. So, you know, you, we've seen a lot of movies about asteroids, a lot of action, starting with Armageddon and so on. Why in all these movies the asteroids are uh, directed to the United States and in reality they fall down in Russia? <laughs> Okay, it's a joke, but... <laughs> we need to ask uh, Bruce Willis why he is always helping to save the planet, right? And so we really need to address those, you know, the, those Hollywood producers. But I don't, want to, I don't want to have asteroid directed on any part of the planet, right? So let's save the planet. Well, what, whatever it takes, we need to save the planet. <laughs> okay, sorry. I leave the, the serious questions to my colleagues. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it seems like uh, with uh, increasing technology and better things, I mean, very soon we will have more, almost 100% knowledge of all the asteroids down to 30 meters, if I go to right. At least you had a number of 97% in five years then. But so my question would rather be uh, this, that uh, not... Everything is in stable orbits all the time. In particular, I mean, where are many asteroids, they would disturb each other, and suddenly something would come from the asteroid belt towards us. Or uh, we know there's all these kind of lurking comets far out in the orbit cloud, and there, and then, uh, or even further out. And sometimes they get disturbed and start to come towards the sun. I mean, so basically, are the numbers for the probability for that, and how how much time would we have to kind of and uh, detect it. When do we know, okay, if it's coming here, we will have, so, I don't know, months or years to kind of deflect it? This is a very good question. There are two parts on your question. First one is, uh, is the population of asteroids static? Static. It's not static. Because basically the number will be increasing because they're collisions. And so those orbits are not, we can predict those orbits, but then there may be collisions in the, in the, in the asteroid belt. Plus there will be some perturbations by planets, lar larger planets. So those orbits are not stable, but we need to keep monitoring them. Once we discover 97%, it's not over. We need to keep that population in check. And so seeing if we get any more asteroids, which will be potentially hazardous. So the, the game will, nev will, will never stop. We need to keep monitoring them. Then it depends on the asteroid, essentially on the trajectory. How far do we need to, how far from Earth do we need to discover potentially hazardous asteroid? And so for that, we need to be able to deploy the tools, the analytical tools. Mark mentioned ESA has a wonderful set of tools to propagate the trajectory of asteroid that one is discovered. NASA has the same. So many agencies have a similar, similar uh, capabilities that will be able to not only predict the collision, but also parameters of the collision. So uh, many of those collisions that we see now uh, may impact Earth in uh, like uh, 80 years from now, 40 years from now. Probability is, uh, is not zero, right? So it depends on the event uh, which one essentially uh, we, will be have, we will have to deal with. So depending on the event, we may have to deploy a mission uh, to the asteroid that will be able to either break it a, pieces, a piece so that uh, ultimately each piece will not be as dangerous as the whole thing. But yet uh, potentially changing maybe even albedo, painting asteroid in, in time, right? So solar radiation uh, pressure will remove Yarkovsky effect, will slightly affect, nudge the trajectory of the asteroid. There may be some other ways to actually divert the trajectory. But we need to, as a society, we need to recognize this as a potential threat to life here and to, to develop those technologies and being able to deploy them rapidly. I think we have the technology that actually will allow us to divert, to reduce the risk. But now as a society, we need to be able to recognize and deploy that, uh, this technology to, to do that. So I think in terms of technology, we have it. And so it's, it's up to the society to actually make the next step. Thanks. Yes, it, it, it looks like the, our capability of detecting uh, asteroids has gone out 
really exponentially in the last years. I'm, I would say in the last, I don't know, 15 years or 20 years or something like that. And it keeps going up really high. That, that doesn't mean that there are more astronauts. It's, it's more that more asteroids. It, it means that we are able to see more of them. It's not that they were not there before. It's simply that we did not see them. But the question is, uh, what is our purpose of looking at asteroids? Is because we want to figure out which one are potentially dangerous or just to make a survey of how many asteroids there are around? Wonderful question. In addition to asteroids that we are aware of, the main belt and different you know, asteroids that we are dealing with in the solar system, we now seem to have uh, interstellar visitors. And so those interstellar objects, they come in unexpected and they're unannounced. And usually we do expect quite a few of them going through the solar system any given moment. So statistically, so it would be because we, our, our capability is not yet uh, up uh, on par with their sort of, with their flux. But potentially, any given moment, there may be a few of those interstellar asteroids going through the different regions of the solar system. To predict them, we don't know. There is no way to do this. Detect them in, in appropriate time will be a good thing. But then, what is the purpose? I think the main driver, science is wonderful, and I think we, we need to understand their populations, their sort of how their dynamics, but saving life on this planet is the most important thing because, look, we are benefited from the fact that we are born on the planet that has some very boring orbit, very circular orbit around the sun, where the radiation from the sun always pretty much the same. The temperature is not too cold and not too, not too warm, right? So we are there. It took, still took 4.5 billion years to develop life to the point where you and I, we can have this conversation. And so, but for us, we need to recognize the importance of that and protect life on the planet. So it's not moving to Mars is the answer. It's to protect Earth here and to develop technology and making sure that life here will continue. Moving to Mars is a different thing, but we need to make sure that life here will go further, many more generations for people. That's, I think, the most important part. Thank you very much for that. I have one minute. Don't go away yet. Does anyone have any questions? I have one time for one question, or we can take them all at the end if you wish. Let's leave it all till the end then. Thank you for, very much for such an enlightening lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, our third speaker is Nancy Wolfson who is a uh, DC, Washington DC, US based scholar, lecturer, and reader. And she has over 18 years of professional managerial experience. And she has published extensively uh, in uh, as peer reviewed journals. Uh, she's interested in space exploration, sustainability, planetary defense related topics. And she has become a very respected uh, person in the, in the space industry. She is the president of the of a company called Disrupting Space. I like disrupting things, very good. And it's dedicated to developing strategies to assist enterprises in the new space exploration related activities. She is currently the vice chair of the IAF, Risk Management Committee, and she contributes quite extensively to uh, uh, the field of near-Earth objects and looking at new initiatives and research projects in that field. Uh, she was elected chair of the, IAF, of the IAF committee. I'll be talking about you, not anybody else. Don't worry. Yeah, I see, I see. <laughs> uh, the IAF uh, Space uh, Investment Committee and she focuses on space sustainability. But what is really interesting is that Nancy aims to democratize access to higher learning. It's a very noble uh, aspect of her uh, yes. CV. And she, makes she wants to make space concepts accessible to all academics, to corporations, and also to the general public. And today she will talk, uh, she will cover the importance of uh, a citizen scientist's contribution to planetary defense. So please join me in welcoming Nancy Wolfson to the stage. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? So I, I don't hear myself, just, just so you know. <laughs> so um, thank you for being here. Um, Asteroid Day is such an important event for our community. It brings us together once a year, and it allows us to get that very important, close that very important gap between the experts and the general public. So thank you so much for all the organizers of this Asteroid Day 2023, and welcome to Luxembourg for the ones that are outsiders. Those flies are long. <laughs> Let's start with this presentation. I'm not going to introduce myself because he did such an amazing job. That was a long story. So now you know more than I know about myself. <laughs> so planetary defense. The reason that we do planetary defense on a very basic um, statement is because we care. We care about this planet. We care about the life that we want to save. And we care about continuing with this human experience, either here or in outer space. As we are looking forward to become a multiplanetary system, we need to learn how to protect what we know. We need to learn how to protect what we care about. And we need to learn how to continue having this amazing experience of the ones that we love and the things that we love to do in this planet. Right? And for that, we need our planet. So let's talk about planetary defense and citizen science and amateur astronomers. Now, um, I'm going to have my little slides because I tend to talk forever. So <laughs> I'm going to try to be concise. And my apologies, I have an educator's mind. So you're gonna see a lot of writing, but don't be afraid. You don't need to read them all. Those are for you. <laughs> Those are homework, okay? I will give you homework, so fair enough. Now. With my presentation, what I, what I really hope to, to accomplish is I'm talking among experts, so I'm not planning to lecture <laughs> you, although you are my seniors, I'm learning from you, right? But in case if you are um, new on this topic or you're just caring about it, you're a part of the university, you're a student or something, so please, um, Get adva take advantage of this presentation because it will give you some really excuses for you to care about planetary defense and get involved with the fantastic experts that we have here today. All right, so let me see. How do you go with, yay. So that's me, now you know. <laughs> and yes, planetary defense. So one of the things that we are going to see in this presentation is I will cover some of the very, can I just use this one? Okay. And the reason I'm gonna try to be facing you instead of facing my, oh, yes, I have two. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. So, planetary defense. What you see right now in front of you is the, um, yeah, is the European Commission. So the European Commission gave us the very beautiful statement of what is uh, citizen science. It's a, voluntar it's a voluntary participation of non-professional scientists in research and innovation at different stages of the, pro uh, of the process and at different level of engagement from shaping research agendas and policies to gathering, processing, and analyzing data and assessing the outcomes of research. So these are the basics. What you see on the other side are the different things that you can get when you get your citizen scientists involved in science and technology. Let's go to the next one. And I know we only have 10 minutes, so I have like 15 of these ones, so I'm gonna go really fast. Now, what are the citizen science and amateur astronomers to planetary defense? Sorry, to planetary defense. Well, as you can see behind me, among the many examples of the contribution of our, our amateur astronomers in collaboration with the professional astronomers, we have these two examples right behind me. So that is homework. If you wish to know more about them, please, this is how you find them. But we have many. Now, these are the contributions when it comes to finding NEOs, when it comes to discovering new asteroids. But can citizen science scientists and amateur astronomers do more for planetary defense besides just helping us to find NEOs? I believe yes. So if we go with the White House release, releases every year 
at least in the recent years, their planetary defense reports. If you want to learn more about these two fantastic reports, no excuses. Again, I said I'm going to give you homework. You have the links right below each of them, and you can read the whole um, report, which is fantastic. My focus on these reports are the sections that talks about the importance to engage new um, audiences in planetary defense. This is backed by the experts. We all know that getting new audiences involved in planetary defense is important. And when it comes to mitigation efforts, getting the people around the area that could potentially experience an asteroid impact threat is vital. If because we don't have engaged communities, there will be a continue, there will be a miss uh, communication. And that gap is important. If we don't close that gap, we are risking a lot of things that can go wrong in case of our mitigation planning. So, okay, so I'm giving you the sections, no excuses, 3.5 and 4. Those are the sections that will validate the reason why our experts believe that we need new audiences, citizen scientists, and amateur astronomers. So please, I encourage you to read this fantastic report. And the 2000, 2023 is mainly focused um, on the nuances of getting citizen science scientists involved in planetary defense. All right, I said I have 15 of these, so let's go to the next one. What I'm doing with these reports is not me talking about the reports because you can read them. It's just giving you where the information that you are seeing is coming from, okay? Now, we all know about the Chelyabinsky event. We know 2013, what happened. It was in Russia, and unfortunately, we had about 1,600 injured people through the shock wave, and mostly from the bro broken glass. I'm not gonna give you the whole story, but what I wanna tell you about this specific event is that gave us the opportunity to understand how important is having the community engaged when it comes to studying asteroid impacts. In this case, yeah, you see, the, everybody knows this, many of the reports were based on the amateur astronomers' videos, cameras of the citizen scientists. How many? These are not even half of it. We have recorded over a thousand media outlets that use the amateur astronomers and the citizen scientists material, either videos, photos, and similars in their professional reporting, okay? But again, I wanna go beyond what we think about citizen scientists and what we think about amateur astronomers. Are they just a bunch of people running around with cameras when it comes to planetary defense? Let me defer from that, because they might be more than that we might actually get more access to what we really want to accomplish with our mitigation efforts if we really take advantage of what a community leader, not just our authorities on a regional level, but our community leaders can do for us in planetary defense efforts if we care to get them engaged. So let's continue. Yes, so planetary defense is based on the data that we can collect. And thanks to the Chalomunsky event, it's the first time in our history, which planetary defense is still a baby, is still in the making, but nevertheless, reports are so important. And as you can see behind me, out of the many reports and the many articles uh, um, based on this specific event, at least 30 to 40% of those reports were based on the interviews that were made to the locals, on, on their experiences, and of course, their visual materials, such as those videos and those photographs. And as you can read, in one of them, even, it says, um, I, put it, I didn't put the links of those, but you can find them, and if you try to find them, probably you find more than, than me. 
So most of the important sections uh, were citizen science or amateur astronomers collaborated with information. In this specific article, which is one of the ones that I care about, is section C and the amateur contributions to, um, in this specific article is where we can see that they determined a lot of things about the speed, the uh, technical aspects of what happened in that specific um, event. Okay, so I recommend particularly my, perfect, my favorite number four. Now, if we go to the number one, it also gives us some information. And they were able to uh, get that information from the locals in their reports and analyze the physical properties, the, uh, the Chalowinski meter, including the size, energy, trajectory, and explosive using data from a variety of sources, including the amateur photographers and videos, and also their own some interviews that they did, okay? So this is what they can do when it comes to research. Now, let me tell you about this. This is fantastic. Okay, we go, we interview the locals, we get their photos, we get their videos, fantastic. Now, what about if instead of just using them as a source, we actually get them involved in our research? What about if we create participatory research projects? where they are actually part of this endeavor instead of just being an element. Just giving you some homework as something to think. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Okay, I also want to touch about a few aspects that is going to be important in the near future when it comes to mitigation aspects, uh, efforts to care for. Okay, we have demography, social cultural anthropology, and for planetary defense mitigation efforts. Now, this is where I encourage a multidisciplinary approach. This is not new, I'm not the first one saying this, but it is important to have all of these concepts around getting new audiences and other experts in planetary defense, putting our foot down and saying, how are we going to do this, right? So if you see this, this is mostly handled by the experts in disaster management. Now, disaster management is not new. We, there is a lot of lessons that we can learn from the experts in disaster management. We have the International Federation of Red Cross. They've been doing this for, what, close to 100, over 100 years already, and it's been recorded. They have fantastic material that we can learn from. Now, one of the things that Many of these organizations that have been doing this for a long time and focus on disaster management, disaster preparedness, and disaster response is they care about demography. They care about getting those social sciences included in their mitigation um, efforts, in their mitigation planning. So now when we talk about demography, just very quick, and probably you already know this, we're talking about age. Yes, two minutes, you see? Gotta go, gotta go, all right. So let's go to the next one. We, we'll talk about this in the next, in the next uh, sources. But also, you have a really nice graph there, so no excuses. All right. Now, this is the International Federation of Red Cross. Um, I'm giving you a little bit of what they do in 2019 and what the report was about. Now, if you really want to read something fascinating, it's the 2023 is mostly about COVID-19. When I read the data specific report, I'm sorry, the 2022, when I read that specific report, it really touched me. Why? Because there is so much that I believe we can learn about COVID-19 when it comes to mitigation campaigns and dealing with disasters and disaster management. And it still is new. There is still a lot of homework to do there. So if anybody cares, join me and let's go, let's go say what the International Federation of Red Cross have to say when it comes to COVID-19. But I encourage you to also go to the sources, which is most of the things that you are seeing in this presentation come from this specific reports, the one in 2018, the one in 2021, and the one in 2022 is still under evaluation. So very little I'm gonna say to the 2022, but the 2021. Okay, and because I have only two minutes and I said, I can talk forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna simplify this. Okay, planetary defense mitigation efforts. Things that we still need to care, things that we still need to study. Who to trust? 
panic, uncertainty, miscommunication, fake news, residents and authorities' communication, decision-making challenges. Yeah, we can make decisions among us. Can we make decisions when it comes to dealing with a possible uh, 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 an asteroid threat impact? And can we get even the local regional authorities on board on the same level that we understand planetary defense? Question mark, right? So let's go with the next one. Things are going to be disrupted in that case. So we have disrupted dynamics, vulnerable populations, socioeconomics, sociocultural displacement, displacement and challenges. And then we have belief, belief, disaster measures, regional dynamics and expectations. All of these are factors that when it comes to dealing with a disaster will be important and relevant because no community is going to be experiencing this as any other community. And we're talking just about <laughs> on a regional state. We're not even talking about this on a country level, right? I had a very interesting conversation early today with a couple of colleagues, and I see them now. And yes, it came, it came to the conclusion that we are still making these processes. We're still learning what we need to do for planetary defense mitigation efforts. And once we, once we get the communication rolling, okay, I won, same page, the United Nations, right? We have our space agencies already involved. Let's say we have our authorities already involved on a, on a federal level, fantastic. What about the very little tiny city could potentially be the target? How do we get those locals involved? How do we get the local authorities caring just as much as everybody else cares that knows about the topic? Those comes with a question mark. I got it, I gotta go, that's it. Um, yeah, so more, more stuff to read. Please go and you have this kind of like a bulletin <laughs> slash mini report for you. So please read it on your own time. And yeah, so. I guess the only last thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to conclude it with this, is engaging trusted figures. How important is that? Communities. People often trust community members than, that more than unfamiliar experts. Amateur astronomers and citizen scientists can use the report and familiarity with their region to communicate information or emergency measures in a relatable ways, reducing chaos, fears, fear, panic, uncertainty, and increasing acceptance of mitigation strategies for an asteroid impact threat. So with this, I'm going to conclude because these are two projects that we have ongoing, which is the Greenville Observatory uh, NEO project, and then we have another one that is with SETI, and it's a nickname an asteroid, so those are two awesome projects that I'm involved in, so you care. You have excuse to get involved with us. Uh, yeah, this is me, and thank you so much. It will be very uh, irres irresponsible to not care about our citizen sciences, scientists and amateur astronomers, because we could be missing out of very supporter, supportive um, uh, community members in planetary defense mitigation efforts. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, uh, I really would like if you can keep the answers short because we still have two more yeah. speakers and just yeah. out of respect for them. So, so first question. Um, uh, as we know, uh, the civil society looks to be more concerned about all these uh, hazards that could happen on Earth. Uh, we developed in the framework of the Association of Space Explorers the Near Earth Objects Committee uh, leaded many years by Rusty Schweikart. By the way, uh, today was instituted the, the Schweikart Prize for young uh, researchers uh, doing uh, uh, research in the field of asteroids. And also the Asteroid Foundation was founded by private uh, personalities uh, in the field. And there are many other private initiatives in this field. How do you see uh, the connection between uh, the activities dedicated to the civil society to awareness the people about the asteroids comparing with the public ones, with the big institutions who really take measures in case of something. 
I think it's a good symbiosis uh, between the two uh, of them, but maybe it's necessary sometimes to involve more the uh, state institutions, governmental institutions yes. in these things. Oh. W what is your opinion? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we, uh, th there are still so many, so, so many um, um, areas where we are neglecting, I believe we're neglecting communication. Uh, one of those is on an authority level on a um, civil uh, uh, level too. But what I honestly believe is that we have to be proactive in our communication. Now, one thing is having our own specific projects, and yes, everybody wants to keep those in a little house, and why not? You wanna represent your project and you wanna keep it going, right? But there is one thing about participatory um, as I said before, part participatory research. I do believe that research is an area where we are neglecting collaboration and where we can do more on, on that authority level, but also on a community level. So if I'm not mistaken, and let me know if I'm giving you the answer that you're looking for, I believe that research will be an area where we have to focus how do we conduct research for planetary defense. Because one thing is having events, one thing is going and having projects, one thing is trying to raise awareness, and the many ways that we have. But research is what really gonna get us going with the right data. I think in that's, terms that's of communication. A, I think that's a very, very good point. And I, yeah. with that, I would like to go to Christopher, please, if you have. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm convinced the more people that understand, that understand research and kind of contribute to it, the better it is. And, and also think I well understand what an amateur astro astro astronomer is. Uh, I have a feeling though, that with the development of the new technologies, as the previous speaker was telling, that th the new discoveries will be fewer fr from amateur astronauts, astronomers than others. However, I do not understand really what is a citizen scientist? Well, what is defining a citizen scientist? Well, a citizen science, as defined by the literature that we use, is someone that is um, involved in science, but not on a professional level. Someone that probably, just an, as an amateur astronomer, someone that didn't have the um, proper education, perhaps. That's basically what it is. And someone that actually understands it because they care. It's a volunteer that is involved in these aspects. And because they care, they get to learn and they self-teach um, themselves on that level. But there is more yeah, to say about it. There is way, way more to say. As a professional scientist, I'm mean, sometimes skeptic to yeah, sit and times. Uh, there are I many pseudo-scientists which are more detrimental than helpful. I totally understand. Well, can I, I totally pass understand. the microphone to Paolo, please? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Nancy, okay. thank you for the, for the talk here. And, uh, you know, I, I, I define citizen scientists the one that have passions even more than the, the one that I paid for. Usually they should have <laughs> passion, but sometimes the, the citizen side are even more passionate than the one paid for. And so my question is, in terms of detection, uh, assessment, and mitigation, where do mitigation. citizen scientists can contribute best in these three areas? The first one is? Uh, going to be brief. Detection. Detection. Well, we already know. I mean, we have, even if you don't believe me, we have very little observatories in cities. Just come, come to the DMV area <laughs> between D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. I know we have NASA. I know we have our big observatories, and we have our big projects. But yes, we do have over 20 or 30 little tiny observatories that are neglected by the local authorities. For example, one of the ones is the one that I mentioned, the Greenville Observatory. We have an amazing observatory with amazing equipment, but guess what? It is it's taking work to actually handle the observatory and the city uh, projects together, because one doesn't care about the other one. So when it comes to uh, observations, no, sorry, the first one. I just wanna... I, Detection. When it comes to detection, well, one of the challenges that we have for our amateur astronomers is equipment, right? So we already know this. What is the best way? Well, if we can get more uh, ways to support them 
on that technical level, they will give you the time. They are volunteers. As you said, most of them are passionate. They don't necessarily are looking to get paid for this, right? Nancy, are you going to be here tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. Because I think we'll I have plenty of citizen scientists you will meet tomorrow. And I think okay. I'll be delighted if you can be here so, so you can excite them even further about this. Sure. So I'd like to I'll, thank you very we'll much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before I go to the next speaker, I'd like to uh, remind those who are watching us online, because there are a few people watching us online, that you're watching Astro Day Space Lecture 2023. And I have with me here three, two astronauts, Paolo Nespoli, Krista Fuglesang, and a cosmonaut, Dorin Prenario. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this program so far, because we have two more exciting uh, speakers for you. And the next one, it's actually a great pleasure, a delight, because we've had, we've had experts talking to us uh, so far. The next speaker who I'd like to invite to come on the stage is Daria Alice Shiobanu. She, since 2018, she has collaborated in Euronear, reducing data for international projects, detecting hazardous asteroids, including near Earth and virtual impactors. She co-authored uh, peer-reviewed papers published in international journals. She's been working on the IASC PanStars project detecting near-Earth and asteroid belt asteroids since 2020. Uh, this is the new age astronomy. Uh, she is 18 years old, and she has just finished school and she's just about to start a university degree in astronomy. Please join in me in welcoming Daria. Thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, sure. Uh, so, as you said, um, I am a collaborator. Uh, I am a collaborator and a data reducer for the Euronear project, which is a project that aims to detect asteroids uh, and is conducted by Dr. Ovidiu Vodivescu from La Palma. Uh, why is it important to detect near Earth objects? Uh, that's because they could present a real threat to our planet and uh, we need to have the information about them to send space missions so we can eliminate the threat. But also because they provide valuable information about the formation of other uh, bodies such as small planets or the formation of the solar system. Uh, firstly, the nearby project. This is a project that aims to discover asteroids in real time. Uh, and uh, it has helped us discover multiple near-Earth asteroids. Uh, it is a platform that um, takes the raw data that's um, taken from uh, big telescopes, such as the La Palma one that we have used in this project, and uh, we have to modify the images so it can fit uh, the actual program. And the program that basically takes uh, the small objects that move across the image uh, and uh, it analyzes its parameters and we decide if a certain object is an asteroid or not. Uh, so uh, near Earth objects are very hard to detect because they're really faint and there's uh, proper motion is really big, but uh, we try our best to uh, make improvements in this field, and this program is one of the latest uh, ones that contributes to the field of discovering asteroids. Um, so yeah, this is how an asteroid looks on our um, after we detect it and we make sure that it's an actual asteroid. And uh, we basically managed to 
uh, discover them to uh, manage to, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> to analyze their parameters and uh, determine their risk factors. Uh, I have discovered uh, three Mars crossers, which are basically asteroids that are in the orbit of Mars, and one Hungaria asteroid, which is an asteroid that is in the main belt. But the project has discovered uh, three near Earth uh, asteroids in total. Another project that I'm involved in is the virtual impactor using mega recovery, which takes the images from uh, very big mega archives and analyzes the asteroids that uh, have the most potential to um, hit Earth. So those asteroids are called virtual impactors, and one of their mo motion, one of their orbits, uh, might intersect that of the Earth. So their plane uh, intersects that of the Earth, and in a given position, it might hit it. So we need to analyze them and uh, re-evaluate the orbit to um, say that if that certain asteroid might or might not hit the Earth. And we managed to analyze over a thousand VIs, which are the virtual impactors. And uh, I analyzed 31 asteroids from which I recovered 11. So basically I uh, improved their orbit and uh, removed them from the risk lists. So this is how a virtual impact looks like. Uh, it has a trail-like appearance because it moves really fast, so it leaves a mark. Uh, this is a really long one that has to be uh, analyzed in the very, it has a very fast rotation, so we mm, analyze the maximum of the asteroid. Uh, since we entered uh, the era of big data, we need to have some uh, program that works for everything and everyone. So Euronier proposed that the International Space Union uh, forms like uh, a common format in which all astronomers can work. Uh, the Euronier project has brought a big contribution to the European space to analyze asteroids and has made it possible for even uh, middle and high school students who contribute to this field. Uh, and since 2006, we managed to make this uh, project possible to uh, amateur and professional astronomers, and uh, we had made it all remotely, so uh, even though the images come from uh, La Palma, everyone worked remotely, mostly from Romania. And my uh, contributions ended up in two papers that were published in international journals uh, in um, astronomy and astrophysics and new astronomy. Uh, another participation that I have is the International Astronomy Research Collaboration in which I'm a citizen scientist. Uh, and we basically analyzed uh, near Earth asteroids, but mostly main belt asteroids. And it has managed to engage uh, multiple students from around the world to detect the asteroids. And uh, this is, has been made possible by the telescope in Hawaii. Uh, detecting asteroids is very important also for understanding the formu uh, formation evolution of uh, planetary systems and helps us discover even exoplanets. A project that I've been involved in is this uh, International Science Engagement Challenge in which I managed to learn about exoplanets, how they are detected, the new technology that has been used and multiple methods that have been developed. And uh, specifically, 
I measured the period of an exoplanet using the transit method uh, made possible by images uh, taken by the Kepler Space Telescope. Uh, concluding, it is very important that we detect near-Earth asteroids because they pose a real threat to us. Uh, and uh, they're also very important to analyze for understanding how uh, the world around us has formed, for ex in mostly in their interaction with the other bodies in our solar system and uh, how small planets has have formed. Uh, but mostly because they pose a real threat to the only habitable planet that we know, and uh, it's very important that we protect it. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation, and I would like really to thank you for teaching our experienced colleagues what sticking to time means. Thank you, so, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pass the stage to uh, Dorin. Daria, congratulations once again. Um, you are a future scientist, but you already do a lot of things in respect with uh, the astronomy, asteroids, and so on. Uh, the question is. The public institutions, the schools, did help you or you did all these things by yourself, uh, by your determination, by your passion, or it was uh, supported somehow in the framework of the learning process uh, you had in Romania? Uh, I started off on my own. Uh, I actually got in touch with my mentor who introduced me to the first two projects in seventh grade and I started working then on asteroid research. Uh, and uh, then when I got into high school, I had the opportunity to uh, have the support of teachers who understood my work and um, got me the opportunities mostly to speak about it to the public in events such as like this one. And I think that's uh, really important to bring awareness uh, of the possibility that even high school students could contribute to the field. Thank you. Krista? Well, thank you. Very interesting and impressive. And uh, I'm kind of curious uh, how do you see um, taking this further on? I think you were a little bit mentioning program, making it programmable. But even further on, what, what do you see yourself doing five years from now, ten years from now? Uh, when I hope to. Uh, finish university and get closer to the actual uh, professional astronomy work. Uh, I hope to continue working on researching asteroids, but uh, to send probes and doing more uh, concrete uh, evaluation of asteroids, not only remotely and from Earth, but also with telescope in space and uh, sending uh, space, space missions in working on it. <laughs> Thank you. Paolo? Well, my question is relatively similar, but uh, what I was going to ask you is how do you see what kind of dreams you have in terms of, you know, forwarding our capabilities to detect, assess, uh, and mitigate asteroids in the future? What do, you, what do you think we, we should go, or we should continue what we're doing now? We should develop better sensors, I don't know, something like this. Uh, I do think that we have started on the right path, and that technology will help us evolve and help us get a better understanding of asteroids and um, get us closer to uh, understanding the formation of the objects around us and thus to the formation of us and how we ended up here. And uh, I think we made already important steps towards this goal. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you, the three of you, for bringing us back on track with the time. Thank you.
And uh, our last uh, speaker for the day is Dr. Carl Schneider, who is a research associate at CVI Square SNT at the University of Luxembourg. He holds a PhD in astrophysics from Leiden University and a Master of Advanced Study degree in Applied Mathematics from the University of Cambridge. He is an alumnus of the NASA Frontier Development Lab and has also served as a NASA AI panelist. Welcome. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you for this very warm introduction, Maher, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me, also Anna, the main organizer of this event. And it's a real honor to be here with uh, three super astronauts, I mean, and uh, amazing astronauts. I mean, you don't even need a superlative for astronauts. Astronauts is already amazing. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I hope to present and motivate uh, asteroid mining, so a complementary concept to what we've seen today. So we've seen mostly about how to defend Earth from asteroids, how to monitor asteroids, how to be aware of what happens um, you know, if there are asteroids or meteorites uh, colliding. And here is a complementary perspective about harvesting asteroids. How can we use asteroids for, for the future um, in terms of resources, in terms of the ongoing climate change? Can asteroids help to um, bring about a decarbonized economy based on uh, metals and abundances of other volatiles and minerals in the universe. So I'm a, a postdoc, a research associate at the Computer Vision Imaging and Machine Intelligence Center, as was introduced at SNT. And um, here we have uh, an artist's impression of the asteroid belt uh, that is between um, Jupiter and Mars. And we have here a view of the inner solar system and in the red circle is actually a futuristic concept which might someday be realized in this manner or another one of a harvester. So this is a craft, thank you Mary. This is a, a craft that brings in uh, a small asteroid to let's say near Earth orbit or Lagrange point two, allowing us to launch directly to that asteroid and harvest precious uh, metals that are needed for instance for our electric vehicles, for the batteries that power our electric vehicles, or for instance, in the medical field, the, the group of platinum metals, um, and so forth. So there are two concepts here. Actually, we have another concept as well in the other red circle. And so um, this is, so one is actually bringing an asteroid to Lagrange point two next to Earth, and the other one is actually building let's say, a, a mine directly on an asteroid, which is much larger, which cannot be brought to Lagrange point two, and actually creating machinery on the asteroid that can then mine the asteroid and then bring the resources back to Earth. So then you would be cutting costs of actually launching a shuttle into space. So you would actually be building shuttles and building machinery, let's say, through 3D printing using the regolith or using the, the material directly on the asteroid. So that's quite a a cool concept and there are companies nowadays, for instance, like Carmen Plus that are creating concepts for this. There's also Astroforge as well. Um, so, this, uh, so this is the zoomed in concept of this harvester. Um, so these are the Lagrange points that I mentioned. This is where the gravity between the Earth and the Moon uh, Earth system is about zero. There are five such points. And Lagrange point two is the one on the backside of the Earth uh, moon system where the proposal is to bring these smaller asteroids to and then mine them there. Um, so basically asteroid mining uh, is part of this very large space, new space ecosystem. So as we see here, so there is mining that's involved mining the moon, also mining Mars for precious materials, and um, the topic is asteroid mining and on the edge. So the edge refers to AI, so how can AI assist in asteroid mining? Um, it's very important here that uh, we learn lessons from mining on Earth using AI, and also from uh, missions that actually, like from clear space, that capture debris. So there are missions that would capture uh, the debris that's surrounding the Earth uh, in order to ensure safer space flights, 
There are projects that involve recycling the material to build new spacecraft. And by using AI in those systems, we can develop future technologies that can allow us to actually make mining asteroids a reality. Um, so here you have this, this very large ecosystem and also this, the supply chains that are associated with it as well. Um, so moving onwards, so NASA and other agencies, ESA and JAXA and other space agencies have launched missions, so sample return missions to asteroids in order to test new technologies and to see what are the compositions of these asteroids and to test, let's say, deep space communication. So these are missions from Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2 and also from the OSIRIS-REx mission to Bennu, which is coming up. One of these Hayabusa 2 return missions is, is actually returning a sample in October of this year. And uh, the uh, OSIRIS, um, there's a new mission that we'll see in a moment called Psyche uh, that's from NASA that's actually launching in October as well. So, um, and for size comparison, we saw a lot of these uh, images of asteroids and now to see, let's say, a, a, a size comparison with objects that are man-made. So let, let's say the Golden Gate Bridge as an example. So these, these are how these objects actually look like. So we were describing distances and, and volumes. And so the Hayabusa missions were to, you know, asteroid Itokawa and Ryogu, I hope I pronounced them correctly, please, you know, uh, sorry for the mispronunciation. Um, and there's also um, uh, to asteroid Bennu uh, by NASA. And these are very large, well, compared to man-made structures, uh, asteroids, um, as we can see here in this image. Um, and uh, NASA is launching the new Psyche mission in October, which is to a metal-rich asteroid as opposed to the asteroids that we've seen. Uh, those asteroids were mostly carbonaceous, so mostly, um, let's say, carbon, silicates, and this one is actually composed almost predominantly of metal. And this one is, is quite large. Uh, it's almost the size of the Netherlands going from east to west, or uh, from LA to San, to San Diego, so it's 226 kilometers across. Um, and uh, so the mission is scheduled for, for October of this year. Also the value, if the entire asteroid were to be mined, um, the value is 10 quintillion dollars, which is one followed by 18 zeros, which is an, an astronomical sum uh, of money. Um, so so these, uh, there's plenty of, of resources and plenty of asteroids actually to mine that have been identified by the respective space agencies. So just to give, just to, to give a listing of the value of these asteroids, the most valuable that's currently known is asteroid Davida, which is valued at around 27 uh, quintillion dollars. Um, that is of course if you can mine everything and the asteroids, and if, if it is even feasible to, to actually go there and build all the machinery and all the spacecrafts and use all the physics and AI that you, you would need to actually bring this back. So this is a list, uh, just, just, just for show, uh, of the value of these asteroids. So the lessons that we learn on Earth are very valuable for going forward, for moving forward and actually attempting to mine asteroids and actually uh, making it economically viable. Um, so one of the first lessons is how, how, how is AI being used for mining on Earth? And uh, mining, of course, uh, mining on Earth entails a lot of uh, release of, of toxic materials into the ground. So AI can help to mitigate the amount of environmental damage that comes about. And one of the ideas, one of, the ideas of going to asteroids is because you can uh, eliminate this damage to the environment on Earth by actually mining in space. Um, so why, why do we look for precious metals. Well, as mentioned, uh, one of the reasons is because for a decarbonized economy, we need them to power our electric vehicles and batteries, electric batteries. Um, so there is a company uh, that's just been created this year that's evaluated at $1 billion and uh, um, backed by some very famous individuals um, that, use, that does use AI for mining uh, uh, these precious metals. Uh, for instance, the Platinum Group, um, or rather, uh, these four uh, precious metals, which are lithium and copper and cobalt and nickel. And as we see here, they anticipate that the demand by 2049 will exceed by $12 trillion um, in order um, that will exceed the, the economic needs uh, based on a decarbonized economy. Um, so we can see here that even, even recycling the, the metals that we have will not be sufficient. So we need to have an extra influx of these materials and one place to look for is in outer space for asteroids. Um, 
So for instance, they are using AI, and one use case, for instance, is let's say you want to do an automatic classification of mineral. So you have a bunch of different minerals, and you have, let's say, a deep learning system that can automate this classification. So you can say, well, you know, elements A, mineral A is, in, and predict mineral A, and, and for an output of the deep learning system, you say, yes, I can predict mineral A with, let's say, 95% probability, and with other probability that's left over, it's probably some, some other mineral. Um, so this is an example of, let's say, how the system would work. Um, also, you have a lot of data coming in, so data fusion becomes very important. Uh, that can all be synthesized by an AI system. So here it's a, a, a European-made uh, system, a platform called GoldenEye. Uh, many of you may remember that GoldenEye was also a name of a James Bond movie. Um, so this, is, this platform is called GoldenEye. Um, and it synthesizes a lot of data from, from um, thank you, uh, from uh, rover, from um, flying uh, drones and also from uh, overhead satellites. And that's all synthesized in the side of an AI system, so you have many different modalities that are being input into the AI system. Uh, and then you also you have, of course, the automatic fleet of trucks. That's also an, a use case for AI. Um, so basically, uh, the platinum groups that you have, uh, also volatiles, are very important. So water is a main propellant that can be used for space. Water is an active fuel source for, for spacecraft. Um, and you have also uh, other metals that have much higher abundancies in space. For instance, nickel is 150 times, 155 times more abundant in asteroids than it is on Earth, in the Earth's crust. And then you have the mentioned platinum groups, which are very important also in LCDs and, and basically all the technology that we use, including medical technologies that are used to cure cancer. Um, and actually, um, one in four products that are manufactured use the platinum group metals. Um, also, one of the main impacts uh, is to reduce the impact on, on climate change, which comes about from mining on Earth. And here we have an estimate from a paper by Andreas Hein, which, who is a professor at the University of Luxembourg, where he writes that mining a kilo of platinum on Earth creates 40,000 kilograms of greenhouse gas CO2, but mining a kilo from an asteroid will only create 150 kilograms of CO2. And these are estimates based on a first-order analysis that he puts forth. So quickly, a quick summary of how a, uh, AI can be used on edge devices. Well, let's say you have these satellites, these prospectors, or the Queen Bee system that's developed by TransAstra, and you want to harvest volatiles, for instance, water or ammonia ice or other kinds of um, volatiles from the surface. Well, um, let's say they have to be, the thing is that they are operating in a low power environment and they have to have, they have to be very fast because these systems have to make autonomous decisions. So how is that enabled? Well, use cases include classification as we mentioned. So classifying, let's say, as we saw different materials, different metals that are being found. Also segmenting the surface, like where is, there, where is there this type of metal or where is there water or where should the system land and begin, let's say, using thermal probes to extract the volatiles or where should it aim its laser or where should it aim the sunbeam. So these are all different types of mining uh, methods. Um, and uh, basically, so this is, a, this is an illustration of how this would be done. So let's say such an autonomous system would, would de-spin an asteroid. And then it would extract these volatiles. For instance, this is uh, proposed by Astronautica. Oh, sorry. This is proposed um, by a, a paper. Uh, this method uh, to gather water, uh, this queen bee system. Um, so you would, you, would, you would need AI aboard such, such vehicles. And what you would do? Well, a large network, let's say, that is strains, uh, let's say, that's on Earth for Earth mining or that's a, a satellite near Earth, can afford a large network. But in deep space, you cannot. So you have to. Uh, have the big network and you have to compress it to a smaller one uh, while preserving the same accuracy. So only a small network would work. It would be able to fit on an edge device as illustrated here. This is from a Jetson Nano device, for instance, uh, by NVIDIA. Um, and so this is good. So what you would do, the, what, what the research that we are doing is we are compressing this network. We're guiding the system to learn and sort of uh, um, uh, disentangle, it's called disentanglement, so disentangle different properties inside the network such that we can, what's called pruning, we can get rid of nodes that we don't need that have information, let's say, about uh, auxiliary things that we don't need. For instance, if we're looking for a particular metal, like cobalt, uh, and we, we, we can extract the background that we don't need, we can throw that away and we can focus on cobalt or the metals that we do. Um, so very quickly, I just flashed these slides. So another uh, topic is neural architecture search. There's another method of uh, obtaining such uh, compressed systems. 
Um, and then these are very quickly a very futuristic, well, designs for how to actually capture asteroids. For instance, there's this bagging method, it's called. So these would use, let's say, um, AI as well. Or you would have drones, like let's say the honeybee system, where you have many kind of AI honeybees that are released in order to mine the asteroid. Um, and also, as we've seen, this harvester. And also, you could even have 3D printing that, that occurs in space. And in the question of habitability, if people, if humans were to actually live on asteroids um, and then try to mine other asteroids, so establishing colonies, and this is another concept that's proposed in this paper. It's quite interesting. It would spin up a 300 meter sized asteroid into a, a, habitable, a habitability of about the size of Manhattan. Um, so this is an interesting concept. And on a final note, also it's been discovered that in asteroids there are, king, there are also nu nucleotide bases that contain all the, uh, that have basically the components of the DNA and RNA that we have. So also um, hearkening back to asteroids as, as bringers of, of building blocks of life. So I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for a um, very interesting presentation. And uh, just this morning, I was listening to uh, Paolo talking about uh, going to Alpha Centaurus. So maybe uh, one of these uh, uh, asteroids can take you over there if you, if you really wanted to go there. But uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions from. So, well, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, we suppose that um, in the next uh, 100 of years, uh, this mining process on the asteroids will uh, be much more developed and uh, will overcome a lot of other processes on the ground. So now mining in uh, a lot of countries is a very uh, demanding profession and uh, they are really the, the hard workers of the society now. What do you think uh, in what period of time, thinking how the things are developing now, uh, the space mining will uh, overcome the mining of uh, very valuable uh, materials on Earth, and if they will create some ethical problems uh, at that time. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, yeah, so if I understood correctly, um, when would the technology become available? Uh, and also, when would it become feasible and also ethical, let's say, um, to, to mine asteroids? Um, and if it, so there are studies, let, let me maybe start from the, from the first question based on technologies. Um, technologies are evolving very rapidly. Um, so um, the, the answer is I don't really, uh, it, it's very hard to, let's say, put an, put an exact number of years. Um, but um, there are, more and more, let's say, sample return missions. Uh, there are 3D printing. There is a lot of uh, technologies that have been developed in order to 3D print on the moon. And uh, let's say with developments such as SpaceX, we have the, the heavy launchers. Um, so technology is, and also the private, so many, there are many private space companies that are developing technologies at a, at a very rapid pace and are able to very rapidly prototype the technologies. Um, so I, I think the, the, the progress is moving quite fast. Um, I, I, I hesitate to put a, an, a number on the years, uh, but I, I, I think it will be relatively soon. I think at least for, um, you know, maybe attempting a first prototype, let's say landing on, an, on a nearby, on a near Earth asteroid, let's say. Um, in terms of profitability, there have been studies. Uh, one is by Andreas Hein from the university, and um, it is Based on that, uh, on that initial, uh, let's say, first order report, uh, it is, uh, let's say, uh, profitable uh, in the near term to mine volatiles, uh, especially when water is being used as a fuel uh, for, um, for to, to fuel uh, satellites and to fuel uh, uh, travel between space. So it could be used as a refueling uh, post. Um, and the, the platinum group is more, uh, that's, that's more tricky, that's more dependent on many other parameters, including uh, how, how the market reacts, because one also doesn't want to flood uh, the, the Earth's market with too many of these uh, precious metals, because many uh, countries and their livelihoods actually depend on, on, on mining these met met metals. Um, but uh, there, there's also, of course, the, as we saw, the increased demand for batteries and for uh, also new, new drugs, uh, new, new pharmaceutical drugs that require 
uh, these uh, platinum group medals. Um, so there will be, yeah, there will be a, um, yeah, a competition between all these different uh, parameters and in some configurations it, it may very well be uh, profitable and make sense to, to, to mine asteroids. So it is, it is quite a tricky uh, question. Well, thank you thank for you. Uh, exciting vision fury. I, I, I'm convinced that this will happen one day. I mean, who knows how many years. But I, there's one particular thing I wanted to challenge you a little bit uh, to better understand. I mean, you said one of the alternatives you had in mind was to kind of, by a tug, drag something to the L2. But as I see it, I mean, I don't know how big percentage in mass of the asteroid would be, be useful. So, but let's say it's 1%. Then you would use enormous amount of propellant to bring 99% uh, of the mass to uh, the vicinity of Earth. Wouldn't be much more energy efficient to just mine it where it is, wherever it is. So, I mean, where can you see an advantage to actually tug it to L2? Uh, th thank you for, for your question. Um, yes, that, that's, that's an excellent, excellent point indeed. Um, I think perhaps one, one could imagine, let's say, cases where one wouldn't need, let's say, that much force to redirect, let's say, a near-Earth uh, asteroid into an L2 point, perhaps. Maybe for such cases, it might make more sense. Um, so I think this would only work, let's say, for near-Earth asteroids, so not, 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 let's say, the, the asteroids that are in, in the asteroid belt, because that, that is quite far away. Um, also, it depends on the rotation of the asteroids and uh, you know, how much despinning it would need and how much stabilization it would need. Uh, also, uh, it, because an asteroid can also break up, break up if it's, uh, let's say, if an extra spin is induced, maybe its tensile strength would, would overcome and it would break apart. So it is quite a tricky uh, physical uh, problem. Um, but uh, yes, I think for, for some cases it might, let's say, that if the velocity or the, the trajectory is, is good enough, let's say, uh, where the calculation would show that, okay, the, 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 how much fuel, how much resource is used, um, Yes, maybe in some cases it might work, but m perhaps there are not so many cases where this might work. At least that's, that's my view of it. Thank you. Yes, I, you know, I was listening to this thing and I find it interesting that since we managed to kind of overuse our planet, so we are just going somewhere else and get something from there and take the asteroid, take it back to Earth, uh, take all the stuff, so it's kind of, is this ethical? Is it a good thing to look at the rest of the universe as our place, our garden, where to go and pick out the things that we like and maybe not pick the things that we don't like? Is this even, besides of ethical, does it make sense from a, from a practical point of view? On top of that, we should even remember that maybe, as you mentioned at the end of the presentation, some of these things may contain signs of life and may even be the things that brought life to Earth. Maybe. We don't know yet. So are we going to disregard this part? Uh, thank you for this question and also for, for raising these, these uh, very, uh, very prescient issues. Um, indeed, I, I think it's um, necessary first to have very strict laws and regulations in order to ensure that, um, let's say, there are first experiments done to test if indeed there, er, there is life or if there is any trace of any organic materials because uh, we don't want to uh, destroy something inadvertently that uh, might signal the next uh, revolution in our understanding of our own neighborhood um, and also in terms of uh, the questions about life as were raised uh, earlier in, 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 the, in the talks. Um, as, um, as an expanding civilization, as a, let's say, as a, as a space-faring civilization, um, at some point, uh, I think, I, I would agree that it, it does make sense to begin to um, utilize resources uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of asteroids. Uh, but not to exploit those resources where it becomes unsustainable. So a measure of sustainability has to be in place. Uh, also that um, 
you know, that, that we are considerate with uh, the resources that we have and um, uh, that we don't cause uh, pollution that may, may be detrimental, let's say, to our own, our own lives. Uh, so I think uh, we should learn from past, let's say, errors or mistakes that have been made historically and try not to repeat those same mistakes going forward uh, in, in expanding our civilization to perhaps even uh, other worlds, um, let's say Mars, perhaps, or, uh, or even colonies on asteroids. Um, so indeed, um, just to look at asteroids as a source, as a resource, is, 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 is actually a, a limiting picture, but one should look at it holistically. Um, as also, because it, it, is, it is in a way, uh, as you mentioned, our, our garden, and our garden uh, is in many ways um, also um, uh, a source of, of life and a source of, uh, of, of learning from. So it, it, we can learn a lot from the garden. Uh, so th thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Can you please stay on stage? Thank you so much for that. There's plenty of food for thought there. Can I please ask the uh, speakers, uh, Marco, Slava, Nancy, Daria, join me on stage, please, here. We're going to have some pictures with the, uh, our speakers, here, for our astronauts, please. Before, before you go, um, our sponsors for the cocktails tonight is, is Kyle there. Kyle from Offworld is going just to say a couple of words. Do you want to come here on stage? Can you all stay here, please? Just. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, this event has been going on for a couple of years, and I'm really happy to see it continue. So thank you to Anna and all of the organizers who've been keeping this dream alive. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, Offworld has a long-term vision of using not only the moon resources, Mars resources, but eventually asteroid resources. So we're happy to participate, and we're happy to have a drink with you tonight. There is an off-world drink, so make sure you ask the bartenders about it, and we would be happy to have a toast with you later. So thank you so much. God, thank you so much. We're really grateful for that. Uh, I'd like to thank all our guests today. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Slava, Nancy, Daria, Carl. And thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Paolo. My name is Maha Kalaji. Thank you very much for being here today, and we hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow and next year. Thank you so much. Please join us now for the cocktail over there. And we have our host, Anna, today to thank for everything she's done. Anna and her team, thank you very much. <laughs>